My name is Christina Maslach. Uh, I'm a native Californian, born here in San Francisco, even though uh, I grew up in Berkeley, got, went to Berkeley High, I decided to leave California for college and went back east to Radcliffe, which was the female part of Harvard at that time. Uh, it's now fully integrated, but at any rate, we were almost there at that point. And then I decided after uh, I majored in a, uh, a major called Social Relations, which was kind of odd title, but it was Sociology and the Social Science side of Anthropology and Psychology. Uh, and then I went back to Stanford, uh, to California, I should say, went to Stanford and got my PhD there in Social Psychology. Uh, then I got uh, my first job at the University of California, Berkeley, not too far away, and it turned out to be my only job and my last job because I'm now retired. Uh, so I've been at Berkeley for more than 40 years um, doing research and teaching, and uh, now I'm retired, but I'm involved in a lot of other projects as well as continuing to do work on my sort of main issue, which has been job burnout in the workplace. Uh, my husband and I live in San Francisco. We both commute to our respective universities when we need to, although we're now both retired, so Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, and we have two daughters uh, and also a son with uh, two grandkids, all in California. So I don't know. What else do you need to know at this point? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going, uh, we're set, uh, changing the micro, uh, the speaker settings to the whole speakers instead of just one box. Um, oh, okay. Could you yeah. hear that? Okay. Yeah. Did you guys hear all that before? Yeah. Okay, cool. Now it's good. Um, okay. So we have a, um, a set of questions. Um, well, one of my biggest questions um, has been... Why did you study burnout to begin with? Yeah. Well, I didn't choose to study burnout, quite honestly. Uh, in some sense, burnout found me. Uh, I was starting my new job at Berkeley. I had been trained as a laboratory uh, social psychologist, had done work on emotion in the lab and other things. But they didn't really have a lab ready for me at Berkeley. So they said, okay, we'll, we'll get to it. we get it you know, built soon and, and worked out. So in the meantime, um, I decided I was trying to go back to Stanford, use the lab, but then I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll develop some new ideas around emotion and how we understand what we're feeling and emotional arousal, how we cope. And I think what I'll do is I'll go out and interview people uh, whose job I thought might involve uh, some challenging situations where these issues of emotion and coping might be important. And there were theories of misattribution and emotional arousal at that time that I thought I would use. So I would go out and talk to people, and then when my lab was ready, I'd go back in and, and do the research. So I started interviewing a number of people, uh, and, and each one would sort of give me other people to talk to. Uh, and they would answer my questions, but then often they would say, can I talk to you some more about some other things that you haven't asked me about? So I said, yeah, sure, why not? Um, and I you know, made sure that this was anonymous and confidential and so forth. And they started talking about other experiences. And after a while, I noticed a pattern, a kind of a rhythm uh, to what different people were saying, whether they were prison guards or in the police or uh, nurses and doctors or social workers or you know, poverty law attorneys. And it was kind of, you know, I kind of asked people, do you ever... Do you have a name for describing this? Do you talk about it with other? Oh, God, no, I wouldn't let anybody know. It's a stigma. This is awful. You know, you get to your job and you discover that you can't stand the people you're supposed to help and care for and teach or, you know, protect in some way. And um, so, you know, it was something that was pulling me away from my original questions a bit, but I kept thinking this is important. It's important because these people during the interviews would get really emotional. They would get angry. They would get talk about their frustrations. They would cry sometimes describing some of these things. And so I'm thinking, whoa, this is not like college students in my laboratory. Something's going on here, and I should find out more about it. 
So that was a serendipitous kind of way in which I kind of stumbled across it. Uh, nobody had a word for it, but one evening I was at a dinner at Berkeley for new faculty joining, and I was talking with, you know, you chat with people, who are you and what are you doing? And I mentioned what I was getting in these interviews, and this woman sitting next to me said, oh my gosh, I've been working in poverty law until recently, and we call that thing burnout. So I said, oh, that's interesting. And then I would end, when I ended the interviews, and I'd ask people questions like, how do you talk about this? Do you share it? Whatever, I, I'd say, is this like detached concern from sociology? And they say, well, not really. Is it burnout? Yes. That's it, you know. And there was the imagery and the word, and they were just saying, yes, that, that captures what I'm going through. So that's really where I came across the term. Um, it's been around for a while, uh, but it's more an engineering term, and I am the daughter of an engineer uh, who did research for the space program, and rocket ships burn out, and ball bearings burn out, and there's all... In Silicon Valley out here, when it started what, years ago, they talked about creating burnout shops. We'll hire you if you're a AAA plus to be in our burnout shop where we will work you day and night 24 7, where that concept came from. And until you're burned out, can't do any more, but then you'll have stock options and you'll make a lot of money. Um, so the word has been around. I don't think any person invented it, um, but it became a useful way of describing this uh, in many ways. But like everything that's positive, there's a negative downside, and the downside is that at first people were saying, why are you studying pop psychology? I would have my journal articles with all the data sent in, and they'd send it back saying, we don't review pop psychology in our journal. Uh, so it took a while to even get people to look at the data uh, that I was collecting and um, uh, and so forth. And in fact, the first article I ever published, which probably has been read by more people than anything I've ever written, was an article that I finally wrote about these interviews when I couldn't get a journal publication. And it was for a magazine called Human Behavior. And they liked the article so much, they put it on the cover. So I don't know if you can see that. Yes. <laughs> It's the matchbook, and uh, you know it looks like you've got lawyers and doctors and police and whatever, and they're burning out. And that article, in in those days, that was back in the '70s. Uh, in today's terms, we could say it went viral. Uh, this was before the internet. Uh, I got sacks, literally sackfuls and sackfuls of mail in my department office from people saying, oh my gosh, I just read this article, and I just didn't realize somebody else was having the same kind of things. Let me tell you my story. And then they would go on and, and do that. Or they would call, or they would knock on my door, come and visit me at Berkeley, to tell me about things. And some of the most amazing, extensive interviews that I did came after that, in response to that article, where people saw it, recognized it, and said, wait, wait, but there's more, and let me, and let me talk to you. So that's a long way of saying burnout found me. I wasn't looking for it. It sort of ended up dropping into my lap. Well, well, that's very interesting. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, we have more, another question related to this. Um, yep. This is Eric. He's um, a very good sci-fi member. Um, he's gonna. We're gonna go. We're gonna tag team this back and forth. Tag team it. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi, uh, it's very nice to meet you, Dr. Maslak. Uh, for our second question, I was wondering, uh, how do you distinguish between burnout and fatigue? Well, fatigue, uh, and it's also called exhaustion, uh, burnout is, the simple answer is burnout is more than that. Uh, so simply saying it's fatigue, exhaustion is not, you know, really giving due credit to what the concept is all about. And fatigue and the exhaustion is really the, the sign that you're talking about a stress phenomenon. If you studied, you know, stress literature, that's the cellular final stage, kind of, where you get into the point of you cannot, you know, there's too much going on and you cannot cope effectively with it, and that is what we're talking about. Stress, exhaustion is a part of that. So yes, exhaustion is a component of burnout, so it is a stress phenomenon. 
But that's not all it is. Uh, the more important part, I think, is what happens to people in terms of how they do their work when they are finding that um, the demands are you know, way more than the resources they have to do the job. There's not enough time. There's not enough what you need to, to do the job well. And what we see happening is the development of the second component of cynicism, of depersonalization, of a negative, hostile, cynical attitude towards the job and the people and the work that you're doing within that. Uh, and so it's this take this job and shove it, you know, kind of thing. And I wish I could go home early and you you do all kind of, you know, cutting corners so you don't have to be there as much, you spend as much time with people and doing your job. When you begin to show that kind of pattern, the quality of the work you do begins to deteriorate because what happens is that people, instead of trying to do their very best, are doing the bare minimum. What is the least I can do and still get out of here and still get a paycheck, okay? Uh, so for me, it's not just that you're tired or exhausted, uh, it's this other thing that begins to happen in terms of how you are treating your colleagues, your clients, customers, patients, students. Um, most of this work that started off was really located in more human service oriented kinds of occupations where you're coming in contact with other individuals. We're finding that it's not limited to that, but that's certainly healthcare, for example, and, and social services and everything has been where a lot of the early research was being done. They talked about it and they, they were concerned. Then there's a third component, and this one, interestingly enough, gets even less studied by a lot of researchers. Um, and it is, you begin to feel negatively about yourself. You're beginning to think, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I'm not really that good at this. Maybe I should have done something else. I'm not proud of some, how I've handled some of it. Um, it's not what it, I thought it was going to be. Uh, a lot of disappointment, frustration, et cetera, and feeling that you know, something is not working in my life and, and it's a problem that I have. And once people begin to show that, that kind of sign, again, it's a risk factor for heading down a path of depression or anxiety. Uh, things like that. So burnout is really all three of those things, sort of, they're kind of intertwined, um, not just one. So that's the answer to your question, but I would say that what's one of the challenges of what's happening today is that people are using burnout to mean all kinds of things, like I said before, but they're often trying to simplify it and make it just one thing. They don't like a scale that has three dimensions. They don't like the idea of a pattern. They just want a yes, no. Are you burned out? Yes, no, you know, kind of thing. And it's not a bimodal bipolar disease. Um, you know, there's a range of responses, but they're missing the fact that it's those three together that are really, you know, the, the most negative pattern and, um, and not just exhaustion alone or cynicism alone um, or even feeling ineffective, professionally ineffective alone.